Bless us, Father, as we look at your word today, and I ask that you would help us understand and apply what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your little sermon notes in your bulletin, you can pull those out. It looks rather simple, but there is a lot of stuff we have to go through. With all the talk of this pandemic going around, the global impact around the world, people keep mentioning this word tribulation. We know that there's a tribulation talked about in the book of Revelation, and we wonder how close are we to it, what is involved with it, and maybe we're in it right now because of all the global impact about this. Jesus himself had some words to say about tribulation. In John 16, 33, he said these words. He says, I have spoken to you so that you may have peace. In me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But take courage, I've overcome the world. Now this certainly, uh, uh, the certainty of Jesus' words tells us that we're going to suffer some form of tribulation. But we can find solace that he is our overcomer. <clears throat> we will have suffering in this world, and more specifically, some of our suffering is going to be just because we are followers of Jesus. But as we're going to see in the, in the moments and day, weeks coming, there is foretold for us a very different kind of suffering, a very different time of suffering. It will have absolutely no comparison to anything we have ever been through. I am speaking of the tribulation. In Revelation chapter 6, all the way through verse 19, the vast majority of the book of Revelation, it describes in horrifying detail the, uh, the overview of, of, the, of the tribulation that mankind is going to face on this earth. So at the very point number one in your bulletin, number one, letter T, write the word tribulation in there, and we're going to move on forward from there. Now, this tribulation is not just the daily sufferings we go through in the course of life. Persecutions, illness, difficulties, financial struggles, relational things. Some of you have suffered for way longer than seven years. But this seven year period, spoken of in scripture, that we'll spend a great deal of time examining, will be a time of plagues and disasters and terrors and vile sinfulness and horrible evils and much, much more. It will look, it will look, like everything is out of our control and everything is under Satan's control and that he's won the day. But hold on. I've read all the way to the end of the book. <laughs> hey, guess what? God wins. We win. The good guys win. God is sovereign. His plans and his purposes are divinely designed because God is good all the time and all the time even during the tribulation God is good and we're going to see little pockets of light come up during that period of time as we work our way through in order to comprehend God's virtues of goodness his sovereignty his omnipotence his righteousness and how those are juxtaposed against the vile wickedness and the evil suffering of this world. We have to first of all understand letter A, what is the purpose of this tribulation that is talked about here? First of all, what is God's purpose? What is His purpose? There are so many renditions, so many theories about this point of view, yet scripture gives us some pretty clear indications of what his purpose is for the tribulation. Number one, and you don't have a whole lot of a detail on your outline, but under number, uh, under letter A, it says purpose. 
Well, there's a there's three points that you can uh, label out one, two, and three under that purpose. First of all, first of all, it's to purge out the Jewish rebels. There will be people God has elected, God has selected, God has chosen Israel to be the apple of His eye. He has foretold promise after promise for the future of Israel. All along the way, He has guided them. And yet still, even though He's provided, even though He's given so many times, even though He has shown His great and awesome power, they have chosen to turn their backs. They have chosen to walk away. And so God speaks even back in our First Testament, the Old Testament, of what He is going to do to root out some of these rebels. In Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 30 to 38, it's kind of a lengthy section, but it gives us the context for what we need to look at here. This is one of many, many, many passages. Let me just read Ezekiel 20, verses 30 to 38. Therefore, he's telling Ezekiel this, Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Will you defile yourselves after the manner of your fathers and go whoring after their detestable things? When you present your gift and offer up your children in fire, you defile yourselves with all your idols to this day. And shall I inquire? Shall I be inquired by you, O house of Israel? As I live, declares the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. And so, at this point, what's been happening is they have wandered so far away. I think of when they were rescued from Egypt. They saw Moses raise the staff, and and it uh, opened the Red Sea as they walked their way through. Before that, Moses had taken his rod and performed all of these plagues with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. He rescued Israel. They saw all this. And yet, over the years and over generations, they had wandered so far away, and now they were offering their children as burnt offerings in the sacrifice. Folks, we in our culture today are not far behind that. Oh, how could you as a culture offer your children and not say anything about it? Well, the abortion mills that are running rampant today are doing the same thing, are taking children's lives. And God will have to judge our culture. But here, for the nation of Israel, there are some rebels that are there that are leading the people astray. And he says, why do you inquire of me when you're choosing to do such horrid things? Verse 32, what is in your what is in your mind shall never happen. The thought, let us be like the nations, like the tribes and the countries and worship wood and stone. What he is saying is that, what are you doing? Saying about the nations around you, there, we need to be just like them. We don't look to other nations, we don't look to other people, other cultures to see what they're doing so we can see what we're supposed to do. In verse 33 it says, As I live, declares the Lord God, surely and with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I will be king over you. Folks, that hasn't happened yet today. He is not reigning as king over Israel today. They will not let him. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you were scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out and I will bring you into the wilderness of the people and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face as I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt so I will enter into judgment with you declares the Lord God I will make you pass under the rod I will bring you into the bond of the covenant I will purge out of the rebels from among you and those who transgress me I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they will not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. And so here, the purpose of this tribulation, he's talking about kind of a near and a far fulfillment. The near fulfillment was when he was so fed up with them, he cast them into captivity into Babylon. 
That after a while, after 70 years, they repented, oh Lord, bring us back. And he brought them back and their heart turned against him eventually again. Yet there is one more time he has to cast, to purge out the, the, uh, the rebels amongst his own people. So he can have a holy remnant and he can bring redemption and salvation. And we'll see much more about that as we work our way through the book of Revelation. <clears throat> that has not happened yet. God does not sit as king in Israel. There still is a plan for Israel, and part of that is to purge out the Jewish rebels and redeem the, the remnant. And we'll see that take place during the tribulation as we begin to unpack chapters 6 through 19. But there's also another purpose of this tribulation that is mentioned in Scripture. The whole world will go through something like we've never imagined. And so, number two, I mentioned that there's three purposes. Number one is to purge out the rebels in, um, in Israel. Number two, it's to punish the Gentile rejectors. And again, we're just looking at a, just a microscopic representative of all the scriptures related to all of these topics. In Isaiah chapter 13, verses 9 through 11, God says, Behold, the day of the Lord comes. Now, this day of the Lord is another kind of a buzzword that helps us understand what he's talking about. That's one of the names for this whole tribulation time, starting, uh, starting, and we'll talk about where that starts. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil, and the wickedness for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant, and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. Folks, you watch the news, you see what pompous is, you see what arrogance is, you see what sinfulness is, you see what anarchy is. God is storing up all these things and he says someday there will be a punishment for these Gentiles that choose to reject the plan of God. His grace, his grace, his grace, his grace is forestalling that, it's restraining that all along until one day he will draw that line in the sand and he will say enough and that day will come as he's purging out the Jewish reject the Jewish uh, rebels, and he'll also punish the Gentile rejectors. Now, lest we think that the tribulation is just all about wrath and fury, God is not about, he doesn't take joy in the death of anyone, anyone. So intermixed throughout this period of time that we're gonna look at chapters six through 19, there are moments where number three, the third purpose of this tribulation time is to proclaim Jesus globally. There's been many efforts, mission organizations and missionaries going out and radio programs and all kinds of strategies. But there will come a time globally, this world needs to hear and needs to bow the knee to Jesus. And so we're going to hear about the 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe that will be converted and they will go globally to be a witness for Christ. Revelation chapter 7 talks about that. 144,000 turned on, fired up Jews that have accepted Jesus as their Messiah. You can't hold them back. Now, they will face a martyr's death in many ways, but they're going to go out there and nothing's going to hold them back. And there will be a massive proclamation of the gospel. Yes, there will be people that will accept Christ during this, this tribulation period of time. Also, in Revelation chapter 11, there is another. There are two witnesses having great power and might. We'll read about those when we get to chapter 11. But they will also be declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ in a global fashion. Though locally at their, at their ministry where they're at. But their impact will go worldwide. And will have tremendous signs and wonders that they will be doing. God is not about just to punish the, 
the unrighteous, but to be redeem those who would turn their heart to him in the midst of this tribulation. We even read in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, and I'm going to read those two verses to you about an angel. An angel directly from heaven begins to speak the gospel. In Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, John says, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language of people. And he will say with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who has made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So here, even in the midst of this horrid tribulation, there will be a gospel proclamation. So the tribulation has a threefold part. Number one, it's to purge out the Jewish rebels. Number two, it's to punish the Gentile rejectors. Number three, it's to proclaim Jesus globally. The tribulation is full of judgment, but it also is full of redemption. Yes, there will be salvation during the tribulation. But as we will read when we get there, the horrible persecution and the martyrdom that awaits those who follow Christ during the tribulation time. That's just letter A, the purpose. Letter B, the plan. The plan. One of the main characteristics in the tribulation, one of the main characters in the tribulation is one called the Antichrist. There have been many that have, people have thought this might have been the Antichrist coming. We'll see more about that. But this Antichrist person will be a human being, but he will be filled with Satan in his power and to be his emissary and his agent on in human form here on the earth we're told in scripture that satan can appear as an angel of light yet he is actually the epitome of all that is dark and evil this antichrist will emerge at a given time and rise to great power personally and politically so great will his rise to power be, he will be in a position to become an ally with the nation of Israel and offer great resources and a treaty. And from all the suffering in the past for Israel and what is yet in store for them, they will fall for this treaty and they will form an alliance with this great and wonderful and powerful person that we will know to become called the Antichrist. From the signing of this treaty shall be the get beginning of the tribulation on earth. Now another term, aside from the tribulation that happens here on earth, is the word rapture. We're going to hear about rapture, not so much from a biblical text, and I want to tell you why. The word rapture is not mentioned in the Bible. Oh! Well, what is he doing talking about the rapture? Well, rapture is an English word, and it comes from a Latin word, rapturo, rapturo, and that means to snatch or take away. Now, that's simple. The Bible was written in Greek, and so the, the Greek word is harpazo, and it simply means to snatch, to seize, to take away. Though the rapture is not found in the scripture by that word, it is found in concept and description. Now letter A, what is the purpose for the rapture? The snatching away or seizing away of the church, the bride of Christ, as it exists today around the world. The whole church, now catch this, the whole church, capital C, will be raptured or snatched away from the earth and will be with Jesus forever. Wow! I, we're going to read a little bit about what that's like. And I know some of you think, well, my goodness, is he talking about a rapture that happens before the tribulation? Is he talking about a rapture that happens right in the middle? Is he happening about one that ends at the end, that happens right at the end of the tribulation? Some people say that they are more what is called pan-tribulational. 
It'll all just pan out, and whenever God wants to do it, he'll do it. Now, I'm going to let you in on the secret. That's no secret, but I'll let you in on kind of where I stand here and why. But at, at, at the end, at the end of the picture, God's going to accomplish his purpose the way that he wants. The whole church will be snatched away. Can you imagine what that's going to look like? We're going to read that passage in just a little bit. If the purpose of the tribulation is to judge the whole world, the Jews and the Gentiles for their sin, and would have one final thrust of winning uh, those that would be lost, I tend to come down more on the pre-tribulational rapture side of the discussion. Am I friends with or do I abhor the people that would line up with a different perspective? No. We're, and like I can say, it's pan-tribulational. It's going to pan out how God works it. If I'm wrong, I'll find out. But at this point, it doesn't matter when it's going to happen. It matters, are you ready? Are you ready for this to happen? Someone once described the pre-tribulational, the mid-tribulational, or the post-tribulational rapture is like, how do you want your steak? Rare, medium, or well done? And so in this, in this position, here is why I would hold to a pre-tribulational rapture. That I believe that the church is raptured, taken away, seized, caught up, harpazo, out of this world before that rapture comes. I mean, before the tribulation comes. When Jesus died on the cross, when he shed his blood to pay for every one of my sins, every one of your sins, in fact, he paid for all of the sins for all of the world for all time and yet only those that embrace Christ as their Savior can appropriate that payment to themselves and for them their sins are paid for in Re in Revelation in Romans chapter 8 verse 1 we're told from Scripture there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There isn't going to come a time, I believe, there's not going to come a time where we've got to, as a church, as believers, as followers of Christ, go through the tribulation and suffer the wrath of punishment for the Jews, for the Gentiles, to somehow find salvation as God judges this world for their sin, that we as a church go through that because when Jesus paid the penalty for our sins, it is finished. The church has nothing more to pay for the sinfulness of our ways. That sin is covered, then that sin is covered by the blood of the cross. And we are saved eternally forever by him. And there is therefore now no condemnation, no reason to suffer more through the tribulation as judgment for sin. I find a little hint of that. We kind of were given that little tiny hint as we went through the seven churches and in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, he's talking about the church of Philadelphia. And he says to the church of Philadelphia, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. And so here we see that his purpose for this rapture is to take us out, take us away from the, tri the tribulation that will be unleashed upon the earth. That's the purpose. Now the plan. Uh, there's kind of three parts here too. So here we go. The first part. The rapture, again, it's implied. And I'd like us to look. You're kind of wondering, when is he ever going to get into the book of Revelation? Right now, chapter 4, verse 1. It's really a picture in heaven. John has been busy. He has been uh, uh, writing down all of the revelation he's given to him. The things that were, which was the, the picture of what Jesus has been like in heaven since he's ascended there. The things that are, which are the seven churches of that day. And the things that will be, the things that are yet to his future. And here we go. Chapter 4, verse 1. After these things, after the writing down of his 
letters to all seven churches. After these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard sounded like the voice of a trumpet speaking with me and said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. The invitation, the call, come up here. Now, just as the rapture is not named specifically in the book of Revelation, it's still there. Just like the, the term Trinity is not mentioned in Scripture, but God's triune nature is clearly taught in Scripture. Here I see that as John goes up, that's a picture for us of the calling of the entire church is, up, is called up to heaven. There is no mention there is no mention of the church anywhere on earth during the chapters 6 through 19. The church is mentioned multiple, multiple times in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. Chapters 4 and 5 is kind of a little peek into the throne room of heaven. And then starting in chapters 6 through 19, there is no mention whatsoever of the church in heaven. I'm sorry, of the church on earth. The church is mentioned again after the tribulation. Now notice here, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're going to go back and talk about what this rapture might look like, what it will look like, how our minds might grasp what it looks like. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, we'll, look, we'll look at verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Now this takes a little bit of explaining. Verse 16, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Those who have died as Christians, their bodies are in the grave. Boy, my brain is going to all kinds of stuff to add to this, and I think if we're going to be out of here before 6 o'clock, tonight we better keep going here but the whole idea is that when Jesus comes those who have died and their 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 bodies are in the ground absent from the body present where with the Lord so the Lord is going to come with those Saints from heaven and their bodies will be raised from the dead and there'll be a unity between their spirit and their body then it says we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall be with the Lord. So we are caught up together. We are harpazo, and the English word is raptured here. Now a similar passage is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'd like to start at about verse 51. Behold, Paul says, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. Now, the, the word sleep is a, is a morphism that talks about die. It doesn't mean that you just nodded off at church. The only way I know that if you nodded off here is if your head goes forward and your horn don't stop honking. Then I know you've nodded off. And I don't count, but that's a nice try. <laughs> but the point here is that he's talking about sleep. It's a temporariness that's there and he says for the Lord and uh, 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 behold I tell you a mystery we will not all die but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet there's that word trumpet again that we saw in first Thessalonians 4 for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed that this imperishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal put on immortality. And so there, there it, it is pointed out to us, it's inferred that's there. Now, this is where I come up with the 
the uh, the pre-tribulational rapture. There's so many people that say, boy, just got to watch the news and find all kinds of scripture unfolding before you in the presence of, of what the Bible has to say about uh, end times prophecy. Well, actually, not really, because the second part of this is not only is it implied, it's imminent. It's literally imminent. Nothing more on the church calendar. Everything has comes before the rapture. E everything comes after the rapture. The tribulation, the marriage supper of the land, the millennium, the final judgment, the new heaven and the new earth. I want to continue in 1 Corinthians 15, about verse 40, uh, 54. But when the imperishable will have put on the imperishable, and the immortal will have put on immortality, then will come uh, about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain. The purpose here is to be ready. It is first of all implied but taught very clearly and then secondly it is imminent there's nothing more on the church calendar to happen yet the third one is it's instantaneous instantaneous it, it, it's unlike the second coming of Christ where every eye will see him and he will come to the earth and, and there will be a, we'll talk more about the details of the second coming. This one, Jesus doesn't come to the earth, he comes in the clouds. But in verse, in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, the dead in Christ will be changed. Now, what I would love to do when I hear that last trumpet, I'd like to grab one sinner in one hand and grab one sinner in another hand and as we're leaving the earth and we're going up, I say, do you want to repent or should I let go? But it'll be so fast that won't even happen. In the twinkling of an eye, scientists have determined that the twinkling of an eye for some people takes about a third of a second. Some of you can do that faster. One, two, three. That was just maybe a half a second. The twinkling of an eye. It happens so quickly in an atom of time. It takes about a third of a second. Three raptures could happen in the course of time. So in that brief moment, the rapture happened. Jesus comes in the cloud, the voice of the archangel, the last, the trumpet that is sounded, whoosh, the dead in Christ are brought up, and then we who are alive and remain, we're changed and taken up with him. That all happens in a twinkling of an eye. Boop, we're gone. There is no time for consideration for those who are still, hmm, well, I'm thinking about it. There is no time to remember what's been taught. There is no time to decide. There is no time to repent. There's no time to believe. There is no time. Your eternal destiny has now been finally decided in an atom of time. So my question for you right now is, are you ready? Decide now. Don't wait until you start to see somebody else, boom, because then it will be too late. Now is your chance. It will be instant, but it will also be final. It will be final. If a person has heard the gospel, now this is where some of you might disagree with me about the timing of the rapture, mid uh, pre-trib, mid-trib or post-trib, here's something else for you to maybe disagree with me a little bit, and then we're going to close with this, and we'll chew on this for a little bit. If a person has heard the gospel before and understood it and then rejected it at the time of the rapture, it's final. But won't people be saved during the tribulation? Yes. Most of them will be raptured. But these are the ones that have never heard or been convicted with the true meaning of the gospel. Those who have heard, understood, and then rejected. In 2 Thessalonians, 
there is the indication that they have already made their decision. There's still time to repent now. But once the rapture happens and they continue on into the tribulation because they didn't believe, they rejected the truth. We're going to see what happens in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, <coughs> starting in verse 1. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with him. There's that implication of the rapture. <coughs> that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as is from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive, and let no one in any way deceive you for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. This is the Antichrist. This is the Antichrist who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. And now we see what he's going to do during the course of his reign, of his growing reign here on earth as the Antichrist, so that he takes a seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. How audacious will his, quote, ministry be? Verse 5, do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time, he will be revealed. It is possible. In fact, I'll be so bold as to state, it is probable that the person that will become the Antichrist is living today. Somewhere in this world is living today. <laughs> and as Satan seeks to work in that person's heart, drawing and wooing, I don't know what that's going to look like, what it does look like. <clears throat> But there is a restraining force. There is a restraining force that held upon Satan's work on the earth right now. It may not look like it with us, all this Antifa and all these demonstrators and all the way the stuff's going on. But there is a restrainer. What would happen if God took his hand away and sin and Satan were allowed free reign to do whatever they wanted all over the place? There is that restraining force that is there. As the Holy Spirit indwells individual believers and we take our stand for Jesus in this world, there is that, that presence that God has in this world through you. You, the church, is that restraining force here in the world. And if you look at verse 6 and you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed as the church is raptured away, as the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is taken out of the world at the rapture, that restraining force is taken away. Verse 7, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Who is the one that restrains? The Holy Spirit through the church. Taken out of the way, that is the rapture. Verse 8, Kent, walk with me on this one. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will, eventually, the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one who is coming in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. Now look at verse 10. <clears throat> this is the Antichrist is coming and with all deception of wickedness for those who perish why do they perish? because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved they rejected the truth God opened their mind gave them perception understood the gospel understood that they're sinners understood that Jesus is the one that died to pay for their sins and they said no verse 11 for this reason God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false you had your chance at the rapture 
when this restraining force of the Holy Spirit takes the church out of the world, all hell will begin to be unleashed. <clears throat> Those that understood and rejected enter into the period of the tribulation for this reason. The reason is going back up into verse 10 because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. Oh! So if, if those cannot be saved because they're been given a deluding influence, and because they chose to reject the gospel before the rapture, who can be saved after the rapture? It's all the ones who have never heard the gospel. All the ones who have been rebellious in heart without an understanding of that. And there will be thousands of them. There will be salvation during the tribulation. Though it is implied in Revelation, it's revealed in Scripture. Though it is imminent, it can happen at any moment. It will be instantaneous. It will be over in the atom of time. And it's not reversible. Once a person enters the tribulation, having rejected the gospel on this side of the rapture, will be given a deluding influence so that they'll believe what is false and not able to surrender their heart to Christ. Only those who have never heard will be given another chance. So now is your chance. Now is your chance to come to faith in Christ. Now is your chance to open your heart to Jesus. Our taken home section has two little points in there. They're not written, so you're going to have to write them in. Take it home. Under review, I simply want you to be ready. Be ready. Do you believe in a pre-tribulational rapture of the church? Do you believe in a mid-tribulational rapture of the church? Do you believe in a post-tribulational rapture of the church? The application for each one is be ready. Be ready or be left behind. Be ready or be left behind. Now here's how I want you to be ready. The next time sin comes knocking, say no. Oh boy, did I get up this morning just to come and hear that? <laughs> the next time you're tempted to feel like your, right, your rights have been violated, become somebody treated you harshly. When sin comes knocking at your door, and Satan whispers in one ear, you, you got your rights. You, you, they can't treat you like that. Whether it's your spouse, your kids, your parents, or the people you work with, or your neighbors, or your family members, they can't treat you like this. You deserve better than that. Say no to that. Say no. You don't have to respond with vileness, but be ready. Now, it isn't that you just say no to sin. But the next time God comes calling, say yes. When you have just the right words, oh boy, someone has said something to you that hurt you deeply, irritated you no end, and all of a sudden, this right comment comes into your mind. I'll put them in their place. I can't, this is gonna be good. And you get ready to nail them with it, that is gonna show them in front of everybody else that you're right, and they're just a sucker for what is false, and you get ready to say it, say no to sin, and yes to God. Sometimes the best way to say yes to God is just put some duct tape over your mouth and don't say anything. Or be gracious. Give a blessing, not responding with a curse. Ah, you're taking away all the fun of a good fight, right? Let Satan win your fight. Pray that the Lord might change their heart. And in the process, pray that he changes your heart. <laughs> I will not go into the details. There was a time that Marilyn and I, many, 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 many years ago, and then also last week, 
<clears throat> we're having a heated discussion. And my prayer was, Lord, I wish you'd just change that woman. Oh. And sort of like God was saying, oh, so you want some change going on around here, do you? Yeah, it's about time you change that woman. I'm going to change you first. So God and I had this conversation. God, this is about what I was planning on. Well, if you want me to work on her and you want her to be open to me working on her, don't you think it's kind of hypocritical if you don't be open to me working on you? Yeah, yeah. So we had this conversation and all along, I was the problem, not her. So when sin comes knocking, say no to sin and yes to God. Be ready. You're thinking he's only got through one verse of chapter four. <laughs> That's where next week comes in. I would like you to read as your preview, read chapter four of Revelation every day. Get ready for the throne room of God. <clears throat> We're going to spend some time there next week to see what John would see, to see what we might see at the moment of our rapture. Whether you believe in a pre, mid, or post-tribulational rapture, this throne room is what we're going to see. Oh boy, let's get ready for it. Read Revelation chapter 4 every day. And until then, and every day, be ready. Say no to sin. Say yes to God. Shall we pray? Oh, Father in heaven, we know that you got this all figured out. And sometimes we just think we've got it, and then we don't. But we leave this all with you. And I trust, dear Lord God in heaven, that you'll help us to be ready. Help us as we read Revelation 4 to prepare our hearts for your standing in your throne room, kneeling in your throne room, laying prostrate in your throne room, to be in your presence in a way that was never imaginable until we have a chance to grasp the significance of Revelation 4. And until that time, Father, help us, Lord Jesus, to be ready. Help us now to say no to sin and yes to you when you come calling. Oh, thank you, God, that you have it all worked out. And we surrender our hearts to you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
Thank you again for being here. If you've got a baby bottle, drop them off here. Doug will be picking them up on your way out. If you'd like to help us pack up and move stuff back in, you're more than welcome to help us. Have a blessed week. We love you guys. Bye.